Good morning. It is Thursday, once again, at 11 o'clock, and uh, we're going to go again live with our Talking to Artists uh, podcast. And um, I'm really uh, just want to say thank you for everyone who's actually kind of supported. And I know that a lot of people uh, try and catch it live, um, but way more people kind of see it after the fact, which is really, uh, really wonderful. Um, I'm in the process of actually putting all my Talking to Artists onto, um, onto YouTube so um, and separating the audio. So if you want to just listen as a you know, almost more like a podcast as you're working or painting or something, then, um, then you may do that. And that would be very cool. So this week we have an artist that, um, I love his work. Um, and I think it's just been so, oh, hey, I have my glasses on so I can say hello to people. <laughs> oh, hey, Andrew, <laughs> Jose. Oh, thank you so much for joining. Um, I appreciate that. Um, so Andrew is a Canadian artist, but I actually originally met him in China, and um, it was very interesting because the more I kind of learned about him, the more I realized that our art paths were remarkably similar. Um, you know, he had a marketing firm, worked in marketing, has done a lot of international travel, um, and yet we have to meet in China. So anyway, I'm going to join, I'm going to bring on Andrew now. Let's see. I'm going to invite him. So I'm just uh, going to wait for him to join us, and hopefully uh, he will. Hey, looks like that. Hey, how are you? Hey, I'm, I'm here. Good morning. Good morning. Yeah, and I see uh, you're in a, an incredibly beautiful location, I think, today. I'm on the deck of the lodge on Amherst Island. It's oh. uh, an incredible place I've been visiting for the past 20 years. Oh, beautiful. And that's, is that a vacation, or are you doing art classes, or...? I have taught here. I've done workshops here. I've painted here on the grounds on, on the island of Amherst Island, as well as I've had solo shows here at the lodge. Hmm. Oh, lovely. Yeah, I'm, I try and do my mine outside because it's just so hot in the house, even with air conditioning. But uh, our neighbor is roofing, so it's really loud. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm well, stuck in I the studio. I, I have the owls and the wildlife uh, around me here on the deck. So yeah. I'll have that next week because I'll be at the cottage for the next couple of weeks, which will be great. Yeah, yeah. So, um, so yeah, so I just kind of think it's quite funny that, uh, you know, we ended up meeting in China of all places because we were both part of this international um, art exhibit where yeah. it was sort of, what was it, 70, 70 artists from 57 different countries, um, mm -hmm. which was, <laughs> was really a lot of fun. Um, and then the more I got to know you and the more kind of I did some research for this podcast too, I kind of realized, yeah, we've got very parallel careers in marketing and Absolutely. volunteerism and stuff like that too. So Absolutely, yeah. Would love to talk about that, but I think I'd love to start with uh, that beautiful painting you've got behind you. Maybe you can talk about what you're working on. This is a painting that was started uh, back in the studio. And I don't know, let's see, it was started as a demonstration for one of my online classes actually. Hmm. And it was from a trip to um, Killarney in Ontario oh, beautiful. in the park and this is George Lake in the back here and this is a rock just as you leave that entry point into George Lake where everybody puts their canoe into to head off yeah. towards where all the lakes join off to the right etc and I was there with a bunch of artists we, we actually climbed up this rock and we had a lunch there and I took some images and I sketched and this painting is from that oh beautiful yeah when I was a kid we I used to live in Sarnia and we used to camp in Killarney so it's a fabulous place. It is a fabulous place. And it always, it's always interesting to me, you know, when I travel other places and, you know, and I do love to travel is I can really admire and love the landscape, but there's just something about that Northern Ontario landscape that just, I don't know, it's in the soul <laughs> for me. It's kind of, it will always be. We were reacting the same way the other guys did before us, like Tom Thompson and, and those guys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I can kind of see a little bit of, um, you know, maybe I misspeak, but a bit of a Tom Thompson influence um, in terms of your bright undercolors and really bold use of color. And, you know, that kind of really nice impressionistic kind of style, which I really love about your work. Oh, but you're not misspeaking at all because it's, it's very <laughs> evident there. Thank you, kid, for, for pointing it out. In the past, I may have, I may have taken some more, maybe a passing little bit of a twinge, a muscle twinge when somebody mentioned that, but I celebrate it now because um, mm -hmm. there are other things that, that are influenced by those guys, uh, and especially Tom Thompson, Van Gogh, and those guys. I'm not setting out to copy them. There are lines in my painting. Those guys were designers as well as painters. They knew color, yeah. they knew form, they knew shape. They knew how to influence the viewer as they watched their work because they wanted the viewer to have the same 
impression of the work as they were feeling as they were painting that, that painting. And, yeah, uh, I, think, I think that's a really interesting point because, I mean, you obviously were a graphic designer. I've uh, done lots of graphic design within my marketing firm as well, as were many of the Group of Seven um, artists too. I mean, you know, they were war painters and they were poster designers and logo designers and stuff. And I think sometimes you forget that, of course, that gives you a really good strong balance of how to help people navigate the composition of a painting. And that's, they're all so brilliant at that. Oh, I think I, I'm not sure if I lost you or we just kind of, so I'm just going to babble for a little bit longer because um, I am also influenced very much by, oh. Yeah, yeah sorry. So I, I, there was a call coming in. I had to decline it. Um, oh, sorry. <laughs> yes, yeah, I'm back now. So he, okay. he, he worked for the original Grip Limited. Uh, I forget which street it was on, but he was, uh, there are many pictures of him working in that, in that office, in his suit, huh. etc. And now, um, I think probably about 10 years ago, I did a massive project for the the second iteration of Grip Limited, which is on John Street. Um, I don't know yeah. if it's still there, but uh, I, so we both work for Grip Limited. That's pretty cool. <laughs> so you have lots of those connections. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, and I would say too, like I, you know, I admire a lot of um, a lot of all of the, really the Group of Seven, um, but probably it would be um, I think Liz Muir and. Tom Thompson, even though technically he wasn't Group of Seven, um, that are my kind of favorites. And I know, like, my husband loves Lauren Harris and the icebergs and stuff. And I just don't feel that same, I don't know, kindred connection, I guess. No, but you're, you're obviously feeling, feeling a connection that you're bringing your influence onto from somewhere. We all do mm -hmm. it. We feel yeah, it and yeah. we, we adapt it to our souls and our form of expression. And you're doing it beautifully, very powerfully. And, Thanks. And you, well, you, you know, I... And uniquely so, Kate, uniquely so. Well, I hope so. <laughs> it's funny how you kind of, as an artist, you, and, well, and as a designer too, you strive to Absolutely. produce something that's going to be uniquely yours that people can look at and go, oh my gosh, that's an Andrew, that's a Kate. Yeah. Um, and I, I kind of more fell into it than anything, but I do love it. I'm, there's a part of me that's a little afraid of like, you know, how do I, if I decide to do something different, which I'm not really quite there yet because I'm still really loving exploring kind of the wood and stuff. Like, how does that, how does that affect your, you know, your journey as an artist, I guess, you know, which we, of course we're all on a continuous journey. Absolutely. Uh, the moment we start holding steadfastly to a point of view or a line of thinking, that's the beginning of the decay that's going to set in. We always mm -hmm. have to be uh, open to adapting and being open to new ideas, not to be flying around aimlessly out there, of course. No, we are yeah. going a chosen path. Our souls are heading in a certain direction, but we are meandering down that path and then we're stepping off on the side every once in a while to explore come back to the orig original path with the influences of having explored yeah yeah no, i agree oh helen just joined us she says hi hander and kate yes because my sister helen was also <laughs> in china with us which was uh we had many fun adventures there yep. hi, hi helen. Um, <laughs> yeah no i i mean i agree and i you know i think for me a lot of it is actually the actual process of doing it is a bit of a therapy of, of kind of creating the art but i um it's why I really thrive on commissions because often they do, do push you into a little bit of a different direction. And sometimes you're like, Ooh, I don't know, can I do that or not? And you yeah. kind of work your way through it. And sometimes it has a, such a huge, meaningful impact on the way that you work. Like it's going to be absolutely. quite remarkable. Did you mention commissions? Because we, we absolutely have to approach commissions with, with a certain degree of holding true to who we are, but also being flexible. It's mm -hmm. a fine it truly is a fine balance. Um, sometimes yeah. we, we shoot ourselves in the foot by saying, this is who I am, accept it, or whatever. And that is a shot in the general direction of one's foot. However, yeah. <laughs> however if one says, this is who I am, but I'm also flexible, not to the point of, view of, point of view of being a pushover, but certainly I want to hear your point of view. I respect the fact that you reached out to me to do a commission. At the end, mm -hmm. of, the day, at the end of the day, Kate, we both have to be happy. So I uh, totally agree. Yeah. And I, it's actually one of the reasons that I actually have a zero risk commission policy. So, you know, we go down the path and if you don't totally love the painting, you don't have to take it. And perfect. Perfect. people always, people always say, Oh, that's just so generous of you. And you're like, yeah, you don't get it. It's totally selfish of me because it allows me to do the painting the way I want to do it, <laughs> the way I feel it needs to be done. Yeah. Um, and so at the end of the day, I'm something that something I'm proud of. And you know, if you love it too, that's great. If you don't love it, that's fine. Cause I feel, Perfect. Happy to sell it to somebody else. Exactly. But, you know, 
I, it's very rare, actually, that the commission doesn't work out, just because usually they already are familiar with you. They know the work, and you know. But uh, yeah. I do think that it helps. It helps people to kind of engage in a commission, which is I think can be scary if it's a large piece and it's a lot of money. And I think there's that fear of like, you know, what if I kind of like it but I don't love it, and I've spent you know three thousand dollars on this commission and I'm kind of stuck with it. I think that's a huge barrier for people not moving forward with commissions. Well, and as you know, Kate, as, as someone who's been in business, you, you have to approach everything that you do with some degree of, of business-like approach yeah. for, for the control and the protection of both parties. So mm -hmm. last year, when I was showing at the, um, at the artist project in 2018, 2019 actually, uh, a couple had come and had seen one of my big gross morn paintings and they absolutely fell in love with it. They mm -hmm. bought it. And on the way home, they realized it wouldn't fit in the space they had uh, allocated they had put the painting into and so right. they called me back and said listen would you mind if you did a commission we, we we still want one of your pieces but that one is not going to fit I said, of right. course so i did all my research what makes a successful outcome for a commission so everybody's <laughs> everybody's protected right yeah. i drew up a contract they were astonished yeah. at this okay uh, contract fine i made sure that there was a maquette done up maquette of course is a term for sculpture but in this case for my painting which i did a big small painting for the scale of the painting they absolutely loved it and i made a little note in my contract which they didn't see that they will get that original sketch along with the finished product so they oh, showed that's up. really neat they showed up they had a right of, a of refusal for uh, the first round of the changes that, that or the piece that I'd sent they made one mm -hmm. change one change <laughs> And then they showed up in my studio, loved it. So, uh, you know, when you handle things a certain way, as you know, in business, the outcomes are that much more controlled. Oh, absolutely. And I think the other thing you learn, because I also have a, um, a contract or a document I, I put together, and it kind of talks about other pieces they like and why they like them and trying to really get them to articulate. Um, and so normally I will go, well, pre-COVID, <laughs> you know, you'd go to their house, you take a picture of the space if you can, or they'd send you a photo. Um, and it's interesting because I always kind of say, you know, for me, this is my understanding of what you have told me and what you've shared. And the reality, too, is a lot of it also is. And it's also my understanding of what you have not actually told me, but what I think that you want, because that's Perfect. what Perfect. I've learned, the critical part of it. Right. Exactly. And then they have the opportunity to kind of send that back and say, oh, no, I really hate purple or whatever, you know. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and yeah. that comes from what your brand is. Your brand is one of, of inclusion, empathy still being true to who you are as an artist, mm -hmm. but you're, yeah. being, you're being empathetic to what's going on around you, right? Yeah. Yeah, and I think you really want them to feel, I think people love commissions too, because it's kind of, they feel a part of the process. And a lot of people are not, you know, they're not creative. I mean, I think everyone is, but people think they're not. And I think that it's pretty cool for them to be part of that creative process and feel like they have some input, understanding too, that they don't yep. really have as much input as they think they do, because as an artist, you're gonna do what you need to do, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Well, that's where yeah. it starts, right? That's yeah. where it starts. Mm -hmm. So anyway, I'm going to change, change the image that's back here to another Killarney scene. This is also George Lake. Oh, by the way, this is Stella Bay in... in uh... So this is... Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, I remember seeing that one. You posted that on, on uh, Instagram. Yeah. Yeah, uh, I love the colors on that. I, yeah. I kayaked and paddled past that... that piece of driftwood several times and I've always been in love with it it's, it's yeah this part of George Lake we have this uh dead tree at the cottage which is kind of uh, it sort of stands super straight and I just love it every time I kind of wash the dishes I can always see it and it's been there for my entire childhood and then uh, last or the earlier this summer I'm like oh my god the tree's gone like it just yeah. You know, it feels like it's a friend that you're now missing. It's not only a friend. You are also in tune to the fact that trees tell stories. And you were reading from the book of that, 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 that tree's stories. Mm -hmm. And now you've, with the tree gone, you've lost the favorite book, right? Yeah. Well, and I'm also speaking of books. I'm just reading, uh, was it The Secret Life of Trees? Oh, my God. So am I. So am I. Oh, I well, my sister, my sis yeah, my sister uh, read it because, of course, she's totally con connected to the trees and green bathing yep. and all that kind of stuff in a very authentic way. And, uh, yeah, so she recommended it probably quite a few years ago, and I never kind of got around to it. It was at the cottage. Yep. So it's fascinating. Like, it's one of those books I think you have to read about five times because there's it's so much information. And you look at, yeah, you look at things so differently. You will look at things differently. It'll change your life. Yeah. Honestly, it'll change your life. 
if yeah. you get if you get the message of what trees are all about, it will change your life. Yeah, I, I totally agree. And for people who are inspired by nature, you have to read the book. Absolutely. So it basically what it does is it kind of says that trees form a community and they form a support network um, for other isn't that, trees. Isn't that, and isn't that what this life is all about? Absolutely, yeah. And I think it's it's wonderful. So. Anyway, that's also one of my favorite books. So I'm looking forward to finishing it when I'm at the cottage and I'll probably then turn around and just reread it all again. Because <laughs> I too. think you kind Me of, too. yeah, you almost need to have that context again. Yeah. yeah. The, the, the fascinating part of that book that I, I just read in the excerpt that actually got me to buy the book was the fact that they are connected underground in a network of roots. That if one tree is thick, yeah. it'll, nour yeah. it'll be nourished by the other trees in its community. Mm -hmm. I, found, I found that fascinating. You know, and, well, and, it, and the other sad thing I thought was because we have at the cottage, we have a, uh, a mulberry tree, which has been totally eaten by the caterpillars. And I have this sadness now about that tree because it's like, well, it's been dug up and disconnected from all of its friends and all of its partners and all of its support system. And now it's an isolated tree that's in, you know, a coniferous, basically coniferous forest. Yeah. So I don't yeah. know. Well, I guess it needs extra love and care. It does, but there's no sadness in, 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 in what it's doing now because it's all part of the, the process of nourishment, life and nourishment, right? That's, yeah. It's all part yeah, of Yeah, that's true. And it's coming back, so that's good. Yeah. It was totally, uh, yeah, all the leaves are gone, and now it's growing back. So. And it does give beauty and space for the birds to land, and so that's, that's all super cool. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. Speaking, of, speaking of books, I had my book here a second ago I'm reading now. It is probably one of the best books on the life of Tom Thompson or the death of Tom Thompson. Oh. Uh, Who Killed Tom Thompson? It's written by John Little. Uh, now, John Little is the son of Bill Little, William Little, who is one of the five guys who dug up the grave mm -hmm. of Tom Thompson in Canoe Lake. That's up at the little cemetery at the top of the rise there where he was initially buried. The decomposing body was initially buried. And they dug it up in 1956, ironically, the same year I was born. And, <laughs> uh, and uh, so this guy, Bill, uh, John Little, has been fascinated. He's been, he's been immersed in that whole Tom Thompson story all his life. So when I found out about this, this is the last book that I, I read on the life of Tom Thompson and the death of Tom Thompson. I uh, have read many, including, including Clagus's book from two years or three years ago. And... <laughs> They, I've, I've, I have to seriously resist the temptation to call Mr. Clagus a hack, but you know what? I'm going to resist that temptation. <laughs> uh, oh, you resisted it so well. <laughs> well I, and I will continue to resist it with all the strength of this meager body. And <coughs> Excuse me. So, uh, but anyway, uh, John Little decided that of all the people who have written on Mr. Thompson's death and his life, none of them, none of them have been from the people, the body of people who would normally be doing this, this kind of exploratory work. Right. The policemen, the, the detectives, the guys who actually know how to deal with evidence. Mm -hmm. They're not putting a spin on a story. They're here to deal with evidence. So he hired two detectives to help him write the book. Oh my God, how refreshing, oh, that's really... how refreshing yeah. is that? So and what's it called? The, uh, it's called Who Killed Tom Thompson? Who Killed Tom Thompson? There it is. Oh, excellent. Oh, that sounds like another really great summer reading. Yeah, it's, it's been fascinating to, to read. I, 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 this is my second or third reading. So, hmm. so I have a weird question for you then, because yes. obviously you're very, very connected to um, kind of a group of seven painters and the Canadian landscape and kind of the whole, um, I think, Canadian, Canadianism that's connected around Tom Thompson and the, and the uh, northern wilderness of Ontario. But you weren't born here and you've spent a fair part of your life in Guyana, right? I was born. So I, was just, in Guy I was born in Guyana. Uh, so I was curious how if there, if that landscape has a, like an influence on you as well. Yeah, thank you for that question. It's a brilliant question. Uh, so I'll answer that question in the second part. In the first part, let me just touch on this one point. I'm, I'm actually on this island now with my assistant, who is at the back there. Um, I'm not sure if I could just do a camera reverse and you'll see her quickly, but she's she's been helping me set up here for this. She's very technically savvy and so on. But oh, the nice. reason, I'm, reason I'm pointing that out is Amherst Island is roughly the same size and shape as Leg, as Leg One, the island I was born on in, in Guyana, which is at the mm -hmm. mouth of the Essequibo River flowing into the Atlantic, the northern part of British Guyana, formerly British Guyana. The colors there are very, very vivid. 
the West Indies. This is part of the, the northernmost part of the, 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 trop, the, the equator part of, of that, that part of the world. Uh, so the colors are very vivid. The animals, their, 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 their characteristics are all some bit on the extreme. We, <laughs> on the property that we lived on, we had very poisonous snakes to uh, monkeys coming through the, the, the property, etc. So I was always influenced by that passion and that color in everything that I've done. And that, that mm -hmm. sort of approach was recognized by teachers at Queens College, one of the best schools in the world, if I may say so without any bias. Uh, and these guys recognized something in me at age 13 to age 16. So my influences were not in the early stages, Tom Thompson, Group of Seven. And by the way, he did influence the Group of Seven quite a bit. Oh, for sure. Yeah. So, uh, and, and the current painters of, of the, the genre, or even the guys around this time, Van Gogh, etc. I, at that time, I was influenced by Warhol and uh, the, the, the guys who were being given tons of money to create uh, conceptual work, etc. Uh, mm -hmm. The guys reappel and, and so on, the guys from Montreal. I saw all of those things in Queen's College in the, in the art classes we took that I, react, huh. that I reacted to. And it's only after a time that, that, that sort of influences settled in like this coat of many colors over me and it is now presented on my canvas. So the huh. influences are varied and we choose the ones that will actually make their way onto the surface that we paint on. So, right. so yes, influences from, from over there, but they're, they're being woven into the fabric of what I do now with the other thread, the yarn, etc., from the other guys that I was exposed to over here uh, now. So, yeah. It's... Which I guess makes sense, right? Like, because you always, you always evolve. Like, you know, you, absolutely. your childhood absolutely and your adolescent always has an impact on you, but you continue to change and evolve and kind of start to shove different pieces of things onto that <laughs> so that it does. Uh... Yep. Yeah. It becomes fuller, yeah. Yeah. So. And yeah. what about your what about your travels? I mean, you've obviously done a lot of traveling. Obviously, we met in China, but you've done a lot of other traveling. Do you kind of do the same thing there, where you incorporate that, or is it is it a different is it a different type of integration? Like one of the things I thought was so interesting in talking to some of the artists in China is how not expansive their work is allowed to be. And you know, if you're trained by a master as a high mountain painter, then you're a high mountain painter and you might want to paint low mountains, but that's not really what you do. And I was quite surprised at that because you kind of think, you know, and, some, and the work is some of it's just so beautiful. You'd think that you would want to expand out to do something else. And yet there seems to be um, an expectation that how you're trained is how you're going to continue to paint. Absolutely. Did you kind of find that as well there? Absolutely. So uh, another question in, in, in a couple of parts. So let's start with the first part. What influenced my travel? First of all, I started traveling because of sports. Sports have been a big part of my life. And because I played one specific type of sport, that has meshed with my outlook on life and it's a team sport. It was always about the team for me. I never played uh -huh. individual sports. I never excelled at individual sports. And it was not that I was leaning on my teammates for success. No, I contributed to the success of the group as a team. Of course. So from that, I traveled quite a bit with my field so hockey. So what sport did you play? Oh, now I'm curious. F field hockey. I played field oh, hockey. And I, I played field hockey when I was a kid too. <laughs> really? Not, not professionally. No, I just loved it though. <laughs> well, well, ours, ours was not professional, but I became an international umpire. I, international, international, I huh? umpired international games. I've umpired Canada, Australia, Canada, USA, Canada, Norway, Canada, Scotland, etc. And I was going for my international badge, but I got busy with my, my art business. Um, mm, which, that's cool. Which was getting busy at the same time as my, my graphic and advertising design business. So uh, that's the first part of the question. My, my love of travel was influenced by that. And then when art took over from sports, I traveled for art. I would travel all over to get references as well as to paint on location, as well as to meet people on, mm -hmm. on those trips. So uh, an example of meeting with the community and, and, and connecting with the community, uh, in this case, small part of the community but I traveled to Gross Morn because I'd read so much about Gross Morn and the cataclysmic events that created the structure of the, the mountains in Gross Morn. I wanted to capture that in my painting. So I did some research. I hired a helicopter before I got there to take, oh, me, wow. to take me around the mountains. Kate, it cost me a fortune but I knew it was a step I had to take. I absolutely had to do this. Yeah. 
And the gentleman I spoke to who was going to be the pilot <coughs> of the, the helicopter going around the mountain said, uh, the weather's going to change. We have, we have a very narrow window. So I, I arrived there and he said, tomorrow morning is the only time we're going up. So my connection to the community was the owner of the bed and breakfast. This is the nature of the people. And I think it exists everywhere we go, but it's, it's especially shining in Newfoundland. He, he opened up. He, I asked him for a shed, by the way, to paint. I was there for a week. I'd been up the, the day I got, the day after I got there. So I had a week to paint. And I oh, brought, brought lots of canvases, flat canvases. I was bursting with the, the, the passion of Grossmore Mountains and being up over many thousand feet above the, the, the mountain ranges. And I had to paint. I said, can I get like a space in a shed somewhere to paint? He said, what are you going to do? I said, I have to paint. I have all these canvases and these images to paint. He said, leave it with me. He cleared away his dining room. This is ornate mahogany setting of wow. tables, etc. I said, I can't paint in here. Do we have any drop cloths? We bought drop cloths from the hardware store, covered everything. I spent four days in there painting. So here's an example of connecting with the spirit of the community mm -hmm. of the places I visit. And that's one that was very powerful for me. I, I was very touched by his, his, um, his empathy and his, his reaching out to say, I'm going to look after you. Much well, like, I'm, sure he, I'm sure he probably found it quite fascinating to actually watch a working artist at work. Yes, because you don't often yes, have that many opportunities. Like you might see videos and it's, it's sped up and stuff, but yes. to actually kind of see the whole process and the thinking about it must have been really neat for him. It was. And uh, also, uh, as you mentioned, traveling to places like China, which we should give a shout out to Eureka. Uh, yeah. For making this so I think I can see they're on the call. So hi, yeah, hi making, Helena. <laughs> making it possible. We, we, we say thank you. And we, yeah. we've, we've contributed to that as well, too, in our own way. We've enriched the process, uh, uh, the, the participation of everyone in that, in that group to being there. Mm -hmm. as we have taken from their enrichment of our experience. So I just a brief thank you. Uh, and then interconnecting with the artists, as you mentioned earlier on, someone who is painting the, from a scene, a uh, teacher who paints scenes in high mountains, that we are being taught that we should paint what our curators tell us, what our mentors tell us, what our teachers tell us. But at some yeah. point, at some point, we have to leave that, that path and follow the path of this, the heart, which comes from yeah. here. You probably can't see it on camera, but I'm pointing to my heart right now. Which <laughs> moves around my body, by the way. I'm, I'm yeah. touching my knee. I can never remember if it's on the left or the right. <laughs> well, I touch my knee sometimes. And then point, I'm, I'm touching my heart. Uh, yeah. Because that's where the wanderlust comes from, going on a journey. Is my, knees on my, my heart is on my knee and I'm, I have to walk around. Uh, so when you mentioned that you were connecting with those artists, that's something I, I don't know if I do as much of as you do, that you connect with the people when you're on those journeys. I watch you talking with people. I, I may observe what's going on. I'm not <laughs> participating as much as I should be participating. But I do pay, try and pay attention to how, what people are doing to, to enrich their experience. And I saw you talking to those people, engaged in conversation. I tried to observe in my own way. Uh, I picked up quite a bit from watching the work, but mm -hmm. that's a point that has been at the back of my experience of uh, how much we're influenced by our mentors or the curators who make decisions on our behalf. Yeah. It's, at some point we have to walk off the journey, the, the, the path of the curators, the academians and do our own thing. And by the way, yeah. I, I mean that in the nicest way possible. No, no, I think you're right. And I think it's like any journey, like you can't, you can't learn to become anything unless you start off with a mentor that teaches you kind of the rules of the game, whatever that game is. Absolutely. But at some, but at some point too, yeah, I think you have to make it your own. Otherwise it, it becomes formulaic as opposed to authentic, you know? Absolutely. And I think it's, it's one of the reasons that it's, you know, I have a bit of a challenge sometimes with some of these art shows and these awards go to really young artists right out of school because you're like, is it your work? Have you built that develop? And they might have, yeah. but have you built that body of work based on your experiences and stuff? Or are you still kind of translating from your teachers and your mentors? Yeah. Like, have you had the time to build your own voice? And once and again, I'm not I'm, always so sure. <laughs> once again, I'm going to resist the temptation to accuse curators and, and academians and, of not being equipped to make that decision of recognizing the flash of, of the gemstone in the sand, the beach, from those mm -hmm. group of artists, are the ones who are actually going to be standing out as opposed to falling back on the, the porridge of what's been done before and saying, I recognize that. I, this is brilliant because I recognize it in my mind of my training. 
So I'm going to resist that temptation of, of making that disparaging comment about academians and curators because there are, <laughs> there are, some, good ones. There are some good ones out there. You know what yeah. I mean? Oh, for sure. And we definitely need them too. Um, I, but, you know, I think it's one of the things that I learned uh, pretty early on deciding to become an abstract painter, yet you have to have a thick skin because, you know, there's, al there's always so much criticism around now abstract. Now you tell me whether you need to have a thick skin. Now you tell me. Oh, my God. You, I can't, you know I haven't, <laughs> I haven't said I've been totally successful, but, but, you know, it's, it's kind of funny because especially, um, especially my work when it's on, you know, if it's been uh, photographed or whatever, you yeah. can't see a lot of the subtlety of it. So I find that there's that, that classic, like, oh, well, you know, it's just, I don't know, like piece of paper on a, on a painted board or whatever, like how creative can it be? And it's like, well, that's your interpretation of it. But <laughs> for me, no, it's, a, it's a very it, creative process. <laughs> the creativity can be seen in many ways, Kate. It can be seen mm -hmm. by the subtle use of a twist of a brush stroke, a color, a, 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 a ledge or an elevated paint here, a ridge here, whatever. Creativity is in, in saying, I've made my mark. This speaks volume. I'm going to leave it. Yeah. Or, or pushing yeah. it until it becomes mud. And even then, the mud can be creative. So we make choices as we go along. And yeah. at the end of the day, it has to speak from our soul. Yeah, I, I think so too. Yeah. yeah. And hopefully that soul and that authenticity speaks to other people. And that's why they want to have a piece of your life in their home. Right. Because that is kind of what it is when they buy a piece of art from you. Absolutely. We all have to live. Yeah. Absolutely. So the other thing I want to talk to you about, we only have about six or seven minutes. Yeah. Um, but one of the other parallels besides, um, you know, China and Tom Thompson and now field hockey <laughs> that we yes. have in marketing is... Um, is our volunteerism. Like I know that, um, you know, I obviously I'm chair of the artist network and I volunteer a lot of hours to that because I think it's a really worthwhile cause. And you also um, do a lot of volunteering with the arts and letters club. And I think the OS, OS Ontario society of artists. Um, do you want to talk a little bit about how you think that's kind of helped your career or why you do it or why you put the time in? Thank you. Another great question. Good heavens. Um, I was a member of the arts and letters club for 25 years. I left in 2013, and there's a good chance, more than just a passing chance I might be back again next year. It's calling to me, and it's always <laughs> called to me because of the people I've met there over the years. Remar yeah. Remarkable people. It's probably the, the most, um, the, 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 more, the, the close to being perfect blend of the patrons of the art and the artists in art in our, in our community. It's that synergetic combination of those two that, that was so brilliant for me the times I was there uh, mm -hmm. so I, and I, I totally bought into what the club was all about as is the case with pretty any organization whether it's the USA SCA any organization there's a small percentage of people and you're one of them in that very small percentage that do work that benefit the whole and you happily do it I yeah I fell into it reluctantly and then I started to like it I've always been someone who saw or tried to see what's going on around him. And if I saw something needed to be done, I didn't always reach out to help out to, to get it done. But the moment I started to, and I started to enjoy it, I started to enjoy the intensity of participation and the joy uh, and the, the, the see and the feel, mm -hmm. the, the, the energized reaction from the group, the community that was benefiting from this. I, it was like drug. I was becoming addicted to it. And yeah. I wanted to do more. I didn't want to see my name somewhere up in the lights. Oh, look, this guy did. No, I, that was not what I was, this was all about. I just liked doing it. No. Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's, and it's not about, it's not about that. Again, it's not, I would say too, it's not about being hundred percent altruistic either. Like I, no. um, you know, I also have gained and learned so much of course, in, of course. in those volunteer roles. And, you know, it, I'm more of a bulldog, I think, than you. And I just like, oh, let's just do it. I push forward. And sometimes <laughs> my board is like, hey, hang on a sec. We have to go play it. <laughs> but they're, I'm blessed to work with a lot of great people. But um, yeah, I think it's I think it's part of, I always think as you get older too, there's a bit of an obligation yeah. to help other people where you can, um, if they are open to it and if they want it. Yeah. You know, like in the same way that when I was starting out too, I had people that, you know, took me under my wing, their wing and helped me out. And there was no benefit to them to do it. It was just, it was really a lovely, um, lovely thing that helped me feel more connected to the arts community. Absolutely. And I didn't do much with the OSA. I joined them late and I've only, I think, been on, I may have judged one show for them and, and helped to organize one show. I'm not sure which I did, either judge or mm -hmm. help to organize it. I think it was to help to organize a show at Todd Morton Mills. 
a few years back. But the, the, the one organization I did a lot of work with, because this is a very inclusive organization. I have a lot of time for them. It's the SCA. And What's that one? The, the Society of Canadian Artists. Oh. I actually, um, later on, I, I, was a, I was a member for, I think, 12 years before I realized that I was very good friends with one of the founders of that organization. Hmm. Um, uh, Miss Gilbert, um, Ina Gilbert, uh, and her husband, Jack. They're, they're oh, cool. remarkable people. And it was only after time, she was the first president of that organization. Hmm. Uh, and um, I, gave, I did a lot of work with them, and I didn't know why. And quite often in life, we fall into things, we do things without realizing the reasons why, because we tend to forget that we are part of a network of interconnectedness that makes this all possible. And it's only over time that it's revealed. And if we look back in time, we will see that interconnectivity was there. We just didn't realize or we realize, we didn't acknowledge it. So, yeah. Uh, I yeah, think it for me, more... it's, it's more, well, for me, it's about, obviously I'm an extrovert, so I love people. Yeah. And so anything that's going to allow me to work with people is always a huge benefit for me. Um, and I have to say too, it's a combination for me about, does it sound like it'd be fun? Like, you know, it's kind of, I think it, it, to put that fun. many hours in, it has to be something you really enjoy. Like you can't do that just to get something out of it if you're not enjoying the, the kind of the scenario, right? Absolutely. Um, but I, I also get bored and I like the challenge of trying to find out how to do something that I haven't done before. I don't think you will get bored. I think you will recognize <laughs> boredom coming on and do something to stave it off. You will never yeah. get bored. I'm not one that gets bored, no. Exactly. I'm too busy to be bored. <laughs> exactly. So boredom never, it might knock at your door, but you will open yeah. it and say, I'm going to do something, so you're not going to come in here. Yeah, that's true. I know. I know. When I shut down my marketing firm, I thought, oh, I'm going to have all this extra time to do all this stuff and just <laughs> meditate and be calm. And it's like, no, nah, it didn't happen. <laughs> exactly what happened to me. I, yeah. I had staff that I had to work with, uh, whether they were on full time or freelancers. There was never a, a dull moment, a, a boring moment. I know, and, and I always, love that. It was always 24-7, so. Yeah, so we have a, just a couple minutes left. So um, yeah. is there anything else you wanted to talk about? I know you do, you have a class coming up today, do you not? Uh, not today, actually. It starts next week. This is my week Next off. week. I teach okay. at the McMichael Gallery. I do a lot of um, online teaching there. They were the first group to get me to go online when COVID set in. And we literally started two days after the word had come down that we had to shut down. My assistant, oh, wow. my assistant got me a webcam. She's been incredible, actually. From the time she heard, you're going uh, online, here's a webcam. Set it up. Here's how you use it. Do tests. And oh, every, wow. Is she available day. for rent for any other artists? Because I know a whole bunch of people who would love that. <laughs> so, yeah. So, so, so I'm, I'm teaching with the Barry Arts Club as well, too. There's a class starting soon. Uh, Richmond Hill group of artists. I teach at the Richmond Hill Art School, which is an incredible art school run by Natasha Tolub. Uh, yeah. I've been teaching there for five years. I remember the interview where Natasha interviewed me in a, in a coffee shop. I said, Natasha, I brought my resume. Uh, do you need to read it? She said, no, I get a good feeling. Oh my God, yeah. you, hire, you hire someone on a feeling? So I I've, do. <laughs> I've, been, I've been teaching with them for, for five years now. So obviously it, it was not a wrong feeling because mm -hmm. the, the, the students, we've had some incredible students at that school. They've gone on to win awards at OCAD. Um, incredible. So yeah, I, um, oh, that's wonderful. I teach quite a bit, uh, enjoy it a lot. And the teaching has informed my art because I had to be on my game if I'm going to be teaching someone. I know. Students will call you on stuff. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Well, I, I'm afraid I have to cut it short. Otherwise, I'm not going to be able to save this onto IGTV. But it has been so great to talk to you. I totally could have talked for another hour, I'm sure, which uh, we'll have Thank to do once this COVID thing is over. I know. Thank you for the opportunity. I really appreciate being here. Thank you, guys. And do you want to just do your what your hashtag is so people can follow you? Uh, Andrew underscore Chetty underscore Sucra. Okay, I will tag you. Yep. Sorry, okay. I've got 20 seconds left. 20 seconds. Okay. This is my scrapbook. Look at how great it is. My scrapbook. Look. Drawings from China everywhere. <laughs> I know. Um, I remember you doing that. Well, my assistant just pointed to the scrapbook. I was supposed to hold it up and show it. Okay. Well, you know what? I'm gonna, we're going to have to do a part two. <laughs> okay. Part two. Thank you so much. Take All right. Care. Sounds great. Bye. Bye.